It's Andrew Klima, hashtag climate change, coming to you from New York City and Sirhan House, home of the best real estate firm ever. And this is The Anatomy of an Entrepreneur, a podcast where we dissect and explore what makes an entrepreneur tick. And today, joining me is my good friend and amazing entrepreneur, Tori Hansen. Tori, Hello. thanks for being on. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Tori and her husband, have the, I would say, fortune, they might say misfortune, of living in the same building that I live in. And True. we first met, actually, maybe I shouldn't tell this story, uh, but that's okay. Um, when I was trying to sell their apartment, notice I said the word trying because it was unsuccessful, but I think it was just fate keeping us together. Who's with me? Anybody? Yeah, <laughs> because you, uh, your husband, John, yeah. uh, are and you are very good friends with Molly and I. We are. And uh, so I think it's a blessing in disguise. Absolutely. And actually, every time you do something where you're talking about potentially moving, I get a slightly sad feeling inside, See? which is why you get these random messages on Instagram from me going, no. Yeah, exactly. So I think it was all for the best, but it is true. That is how we first met through real estate. Uh, but you are an amazing entrepreneur and founder of two different businesses. We have the Knowledge Shop mm -hmm. and we have Meet in 10. We do. So tell me about the Knowledge Shop. Yeah, so the Knowledge Shop has gone through a few various different iterations, but basically it's a founder community here in the city that's designed to support startup founders as they build. Uh, we really focus on in-person networking and events. Okay. Um, and in fact, I had one this morning. It was like a small group coffee huddle. Okay. Um, and then Meet in 10 is like the new baby, if you will. It's sort of taking the lessons from the Knowledge Shop and basically building out a tech platform to make okay. um, to help people in the same physical space build more meaningful connections with each other. So think like uh, a LinkedIn, but for in-person. So it could be you're a member of a co-working community um, and you don't know the people around you or you're going to an event and you don't know who's in the room. We're trying to, to make that easier for everybody. Through tech? Through tech. How? So in some ways, it's like... Um, a matchmaking system, if you will. We ingest the information from like LinkedIn or from the registrations that you have when you joined the community or signed up for an event. And then based on um, your personal preferences, the industry that you're in, for example, we'll make recommendations and then you'll automatically get like an email. So we're like the warm intro, if you will, between okay. the members um, of the communities. Oh, interesting. So the knowledge shop, I, because I know the kind of more behind the scenes. I feel like you gave me the very abridged nutshell. Go into that a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more and our listeners about what, like, what is the Knowledge Shop? Go, go further in depth. Okay, well, um, the Knowledge Shop originally was uh, an incubator to help female founders um, build their businesses. Okay. And that came out of the back of the research that I did when I was completing my MBA into right. how startup accelerators might evolve. And what I recognized was that female founders work differently to male founders. They're much sure. more sort of backwards. It's clearly very generic um, and not true for everybody, but they tend to be a bit more reticent in coming forward. They they take their time to make more considered, perhaps less um, speedy decisions. And because of that, that can often mean that the resources that are available are no longer available when they're ready to move because they might have been grabbed by other people. So, you know, if, if for example, there's just you know, five meeting slots, the guys will jump up and they'll like grab and they'll get that time in the calendar. And the girls are really thinking, does it make sense for me right now? Am I the best person to use it? And so what I was trying to do is to level the playing field um, and give everybody the same opportunities to build. Um, loved it. That's cool. Thank you. By Thank the way, because uh, by the way, I'm that guy that grabs it. I'm like fire ready <laughs> aim. I say that all the time <laughs> and it doesn't always work out, but you, that's how I do it. But uh, well, there's a lot to be said for that um, and just leaping before you look. Right. Um, but yeah, so I started that, but really very quickly realized that as much as it was a cause really like near and dear to my heart, it's just really hard to make money from that type of thing. Unless you've got like a big bank behind you or a VC firm or something supporting you, right. it's like nigh impossible. So that sort of then pivoted and evolved and and now it's the the knowledge shop and, and really... Um, I guess that the impetus for that was mid-COVID. I'm, you know, we're all stuck at home and right. 
I'm trying to build something that I haven't really properly figured out. And I'm just staring out of the window, looking at a load of pigeons and <laughs> thinking this is probably not the most creative that I could be. And I, I realized I was just missing people and, okay. and having other people around me. And so I started um, like looking for other startup founders that I could learn from, work with, collaborate with. And we started doing co-working like sessions together, like yeah. maybe 15, 20 people in a room. And it's it's grown from there. And now we've got like a WhatsApp and a Slack group. And I send out like a, a newsletter every couple of weeks. Um, yeah, just trying to help as many people who are building as well and, and making it easier to learn from each other. So it sounds like you already hit on an important topic of entrepreneurship, which is like the ability to be flexible and maybe to pivot. Um, like, like you have your first idea that you think is the winning idea mm -hmm. and then you decide maybe it's not the winning idea. Yeah. How is pivoting, you know, go more into that. So I, so I understand your, your journey with mm -hmm. this. How did, how did, was it hard to pivot? Did you say to yourself, oh, geez, I don't want to give this up. Like this, this first idea is what I thought was going to be the winner. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so many points there. I mean, firstly, I think. It's really hard, especially as a new entrepreneur, to accept that it might not be working, you right. know, that yeah. so something might be failing. And you're <laughs> like, oh, my God, I've just told everybody that I'm building this and suddenly it's not working and I need to change direction. Right. Um, because I also missed out a whole entirely separate business in the middle of that, which was a marketplace as well. But that was a quick flyby. Um, <laughs> but so that's so it's really hard to, to do that. But. What I would say is the through line with everything is just make sure you're falling in love with the problem and not the solution. And that makes it easier. So for okay. me, the through line with everything was just I was seeing, and this is probably in response to COVID where everybody is doing everything online. For me, I was just seeing that Zoom working and digital environments weren't where I was able to deliver my best work. For me, mm. magic happens in person when you're all in the same room. And so all the different sort of startup ideas I've had have all been variations of that, where I've been trying to get people together in a room to just have a conversation to make it easier to share insights and learnings from each other. And I think everybody would probably agree with that. I mean, we all want the world to go to work at home. I mean, personally, I've never had a work at home day, really, right? Because my business, the business of real estate mm -hmm. is so in person. And I happen to be married to someone who is in the medical field. So she goes in every day too. So we were at the other end of that spectrum. Yeah. I think if we had the option to work at home, it, it's like we fantasize about it and think, oh, that'd be great. But I'm not sure it really is. Like to your point, like getting people within a room together, mm -hmm. there's a different spirit. Yeah. If you and I were having this podcast, you know, via two Zooms, it wouldn't have the same feeling that of us being in the room together and, and connecting. Yeah, no, 100%. That's, it's something that I hold very near and dear to my heart. But at the same time, I'm I'm going through something called um, YC's co-founder matching program at the okay. moment, basically like dating to try and find a co-founder. Okay. And I was... How's it going? <laughs> Next question. Okay. <laughs> I plead the fifth. Um, okay. But I mention it because I had this conversation with somebody the other day and within like five seconds, all he'd heard was in person. And he was like, but nobody's in person anymore. Everything is online and, and had basically shut down and went, no, next. Right. So some people just absolutely do not believe in the value of being together and having that almost animal, like instinctive, intrinsic, um, emotional connection that yeah. you get. Yeah. But he, yeah. It's so weird to me because I guess I don't really get it as a concept because as, a, as an artist, first and foremost, you know, everything is within mm -hmm. person, you know, and I'm sharing with yeah. people if if a tree falls in the woods. Right. You know, like so. So my art is, yeah, it's for me, but it's also to be shared. And I think the same thing, you know. I'm not also saying that everybody needs to go back into the office 100 percent, but there there is that synergy that happens when you're in yeah. the room. So it's so interesting that some people just are totally closed off to that now. Yeah. Since COVID. They really are. And I think that's in some ways also the impetus and, and the evolution for me to 10, which is like I work from a co-working space. Yeah. And you walk into and this is, again, a generalization, but. The ones that I walk into, nobody's talking to each other. They're just sat down, heads down. And yet at the same time, I think desperately craving 
that right. human connection. They want yeah. an excuse to talk to each other, but they don't want to interrupt and they don't know who you are. And so they're looking for permission. Nice. And what I was seeing was that people who were coming to my co-working events also had a co-working membership themselves. So it was in some ways they were paying twice for what should uh. be the same thing. <laughs> so I was like, well, why don't we just try and make the first one more efficient? So Yeah. Wow, that's brilliant. Huh. So I think what's another interesting part of your story is kind of the evolution of how you came here. Previous to being entrepreneur, like 100%, you had a full-time gig mm -hmm. uh, at a little foundation, like a little thing called the New York Times. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yes, some of you may have heard of that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, like, just sort of take a step back, like my background's yeah. media, and I've always worked for various different media publications, uh, everything from advertising sales, uh, field sales to building businesses, which is what I ended up doing at right. the New York Times. And I was the MD of commerce, uh, managing director of commerce. I was there for seven years, nearly. And it is an amazing organization to to work for you get exposed to so many different events, even, for example, being in the meetings where they're discussing, like it's called the page one meeting, and they're basically discussing what's going to go on the front page of the paper the next day. That's and cool. all the different editors are pitching, you know, their different stories. And it's it's really, really special to literally be there when the news is being made. Huh. Um, you but were yeah, in the room where it happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was... The Managing Director of Commerce, which is basically uh, their licensing division, what they were trying to do was to build more meaningful connections with their readers in the real world. Can you see a blue right, line there? Right, right. And uh, that meant building businesses um, as diverse as a travel company, literally running tours that our readers could go on with the journalists all overseas, Iran, France, um, the UK, whatever, in order to really get behind a particular story that was mm. happening. Uh, to also a wine club, a school, uh, an e-commerce platform. Wow. So it was it was a great job and I loved it, loved it, loved it. But it sort of gets to the point uh, where it's a bit like when you're living with your parents, like it's really, really nice living at home. It's really <laughs> comfy. You've got like your meals cooked and, and maybe you've got an allowance. But at the same time, you know, at some point, it's like you need to go and fly the nest and do your own thing. So then you said to yourself, all right, I know I need to fly the nest. Mm -hmm. I am going to go and get my MBA. Yeah. Is that what you did? Uh, nearly. I mean, I've been thinking about it for a long time. I'd always wanted to do an MBA. Uh, I just frankly didn't think I was good enough for it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was just one of those things that I'd always had in the back of my mind. And I think education in the US is very different. Like the process around getting into schools and things is very different. Um, okay. Then in, oh. in the UK, well, for here, you know, you have much more around um, focus on like to study, you need like a GMAT or a GRE to get into like grad school in the okay. UK. Some schools do, but it's really not the norm. Okay. And uh, also here, there is much more focus on grad school, whereas in the UK, it's still the exception. Got it. So Got it. coming here, even though I'd always sort of thought about it, I think just being surrounded by people who had done mm. it, it really highlighted that I needed to do it. And so uh, I I applied and got in and I chose a program what, that did specialize in entrepreneurship. Right. And so I was studying and working at the same time, which as anybody who's done that will realize that is very, very hard and getting up ridiculous hours. And my husband, I think, thought he'd been divorced because he wasn't really <laughs> seeing me very much. Uh, but it was great. And but it sort of got to the point where I was like six months into the program. We were like peak COVID. And right. I was like, I can do three things. I can keep my full-time job. I can keep studying and I can try and do my own thing. But like, I, there are those three options and I can only do two. Right. And I right. was just in a very fortunate position whereby I could take that time to sure. take a step back and to really focus on finishing my studies and exploring, you know, what came next. Right. So that's what you did. You That's said bye to the Times. I did say goodbye to the Times. And finish this program. And now mm -hmm. here we are. And now you're launching the businesses, basically. Yeah. That's where we're at. Cool. Cool. So the entrepreneurship, like the evolution of you as an entrepreneur, what have mm -hmm. you learned? Um, I have learned that, <laughs> I mean, certain things I always knew about myself, but are really very true. Like I'm very much a deadline person. Like okay. I need deadlines to motivate me and to keep me moving forward. And so 
I have to put myself in situations that are going to give me a deadline okay. because I can't impose that myself. Okay. Um, I've also learned that fear is like something that I really struggle with. I fear of failure. And so because of that, I don't, I can, I can be slow in making a decision because I'm really worried about taking a misstep. Ah. Whereas as I've, and that would be like very true at the very beginning, but as I've sort of grown and started to do more, mm. it becomes easier because you're like, well, actually, what's the worst that's going to happen? Right. Like it's really nothing. Mm. And one way that's actually really helped me overcome that fear of misstep and feeling like I have to have every I dotted and every T every T crossed is just by surrounding myself with people who are doing similar things. So okay. they they could be building something completely different, but just being alongside other entrepreneurs and seeing the approaches that they take mm. and, and and frankly, you know, seeing guys run up and grabbing, you know, metaphorically the opportunities that come up and me going, oh, I'm not so sure, makes me go, well, hang on a minute. The world didn't collapse when they did something or when they right. made a cold call or when they did this, that and the other. So that that gives me permission to then go and do that as well. Right. So that's been like quite an interesting learning. Um, and then also I think just the fact that everybody in the startup space is very collaborative and actually very open to helping. And so if you make an ask like nine times out of 10, somebody will be there to say, yeah, I, I can make an intro for you or I know. Um, and that could be like for an accounting firm or like how to register my company or, you know, I need a, an intro to an investor. People will help. You just have to ask. I, th I think that's a hundred percent true. Like in, in my own entrepreneurship, I found that to be exactly the case. So like even in a situation here, like in the real estate office that I work in, where you would think we would be competitors, mm -hmm. you, there's like that, the entrepreneurial spirit underlines all of it. And yeah. we're willing to say, you know what, whatever, like, you know, someone will see that I post on Instagram that I'm with my real estate coach. And some people might say, oh, well, why would you give away your real estate coach? Mm -hmm. Like that's your nugget. And I'm like, well, who cares? Yeah. Right. Like I, I'm already knowing that I'm getting the best out of her. Mm -hmm. Let me share that. Yeah. And, and I love, and I think this is true for all entrepreneurs making those connections and referrals yeah. because we know what it's like. We've been in the trenches. We know when we're not getting the, the gig, the lead, mm -hmm. the client. And we're like, Ugh. yeah. And, and so I think we're the best people to make connections for other people. So I totally agree with yeah. you. Yeah. And there's a really interesting, I don't know if you've heard this phrase called build in public. And basically what it's saying is when people are just more open about what they're doing as opposed to trying to like keep all of their secrets inside. Mm. And the reason being that, that the hypothesis is that people who build in public are more successful than those who don't because the world then knows what they're doing and it makes it easier for them to connect them with other people and to then find the opportunities. Whereas if you're just talking, you know, in your head and trying to hold everything really tight because you're worried that somebody's going to steal a trade secret or something, <laughs> then you're actually doing yourself a misservice. Right. So yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. It's um, networking and just being open is really important. The fear, the fear component is huge too. I mean, so going back again to when I was an artist, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember being in these auditions where I was so, I think fear comes out of the pressure yeah. that we put on ourselves. I had get put, in, put so much pressure on myself to, to rise through the ranks mm -hmm. of singing that I would go into these auditions. I would bomb. Oh, I was so terrible. And I'd leave and I literally am like crying in the hallway, right? And I don't, not to like, oh, I'm so macho, I don't cry. But I don't cry very often. But I would be in tears because I would just be like completely torn apart. Mm -hmm. um, but it was that pressure that yeah. I put on myself. And as I, I'm going to say mature, even though it's really <laughs> age, right? And, and I don't care anymore because I'm like, well, what, like you're saying, you know, I'm understanding like, what the heck? What's the mm -hmm. worst that can happen? I go into those auditions. I nail it. People are like, oh, we want, you know, they hire you instantly. Yeah. Um, similar with real estate, right? Like when I walk in, I'm confident. I, I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I win the listing. Yeah. A and also like I, we connect with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the fear, the fear component is so human and so primal, but yeah. so doesn't serve you. Yeah. No, not at all. But I, I, I do think it makes it, in some ways it can, because- People buy people and the more they recognize like the mm. human aspect that you're not just like some perfect quote unquote person right. with a, you know, a persona that's, you know, 
patinaed and, and, you know, looking beautiful all the time. I think that actually like helps you like open up to other people and, and they'll be more likely to help you. Okay. I think that's fair. I, I, I think what we're both saying is when fear stands in your way. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think we're saying the same yes. thing. We absolutely. Are. The, the elements of being a human that make you authentic. Yeah. Oh, I'm totally with you. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. So I think it's interesting that you had this full-time gig and basically you said like, see us, you know, I'm done. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would have kept that going, even though it was causing them mm -hmm. a ton of stress because they had the security blanket of here's my gig. Yeah. Here's my paycheck. If this other thing doesn't mm -hmm. work out, I'm still okay. I've been doing this for seven years. I'm an all-star at this other thing. How hard was it to just say, you know what? I I got to go this other way. I'm George Watt. I burned my boat, <laughs> right? And here I am. Yes. It, it was hard because like my career was absolutely everything. Like, and it was, you know, it's what most people are taught, isn't it? It's like you go to school and you start when, well, I don't know what it's like here, but like, let's just say it's the same as in the UK. Uh, you know, you go to school and then, you know, you get to five and then there's like another exam, maybe at like seven or nine. Then when I went to like secondary school, I had to do another entrance exam. And then you start in, in you know, and then you go to university. It's like, what are you going to do? And you've got to climb and climb and climb and climb and climb. And to then very- Hashtag climate change. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and to then very consciously step off that ladder that you've literally spent your entire life right, right. getting to the top of. Right. You're like, oh my God. Um, and Talk so, about no ego. You took, you were just like, wow. It's like the opposite of having an ego. Oh, <laughs> thank you. But it's just like, you, you just have to like, I don't know, listen to your gut. And like at some point, it, it was almost, if I hadn't made that decision, like it was going to physically come out of my mouth and just say mm. it without me like thinking too much about it. Like it felt so strongly that I, this was the time. And I think that, I mean, you've already mentioned that you were in a position that, that, you know, you could do that mm -hmm. with your husband, you know, being employed, that through line running through there. But do you think, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur out there yeah. and I'm facing this decision, mm -hmm. how do I move forward? What was the benefit to you of, of kind of giving that up that like, how has that served you as being an entrepreneur? I think, I mean, in some ways, because I was still studying, it wasn't like I went full time into mm. startup life because yeah. I was still working towards that. But it does give you more headspace to be able to think and to be frankly selfish about what you're doing and to start building based on, you know, the, the areas that are important to you and towards your own brand as opposed to somebody else's. Mm. But I do think it's important for people to hear that you don't have to be in a position where somebody else was earning enough to support us both. Like now, this is definitely like one thing that I've learned. Like there are so many resources out there to help entrepreneurs and people building businesses. Um, you know, that could be like local grants, like the QEDC, which is like, I guess, the Queen's Economic Development Council. Um, okay. Just check me on the name of that one there, for example. But they they run like a whole entrepreneurial program and then there's a grant that you can apply for. I think it's like $20,000. It's just it's just closed. But, you know, that's one way. There are pitch competitions. There are startup accelerators that you can apply to. Some will take equity, some won't. Right. Um, so I would just say it's important to recognize that entrepreneurship is open to everybody and it doesn't matter, you know, whether that's your vision of building a new I don't know, children's clothing brand or wanting to become like the next Elon Musk and, and go to Mars. There is something out there to support. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you're, you know, there are, I actually don't consider this until you just said it, like that there are sources that can help me if I really feel like, you know what, I have, like you said, I, I have to give up the, on this other thing, devote all my attention to being an entrepreneur. Then also maybe just Google for five seconds and you yeah. find a grant or something and you and maybe you're gonna have to go and pitch. But by yeah. the way, that's part of being an entrepreneur. You have yeah. to know how to pitch. Exactly. And and so that's also gonna sharpen sharpen that skill, build that muscle for yeah. yourself. Um, so that's a really interesting point to consider that there are there are other there are other places that you can get revenue. Yeah. Right. And then so thank you for that, actually. Um it within your specific uh, business that you're working on now, how do you like gain customers? It sounds very like gorilla right now. Yeah. Like you're in the co-working space and I'm sitting there typing and Tori's like, hey, what's up? But how, like, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, it is, it is very gorilla. But it's also, I think, again, it goes back to 
people by people and referrals, which I'm sure you see all the time. You know, you help somebody and you do a good job. And even if, you know, things didn't work out, like I was still very happily like refer you to right. to anybody that I think you'd you'd be able to help. So I think there's a couple of things that I do. I mean, firstly, you've just got to very clearly know who your customer is, okay. like who your customer is and know like what they want and, and where they are. And so for me, it is startup founders in New York uh, for the for the knowledge shop. And I will go to different events and I will tell people about what I'm doing. I'll look on Twitter. Um, I'd never really used Twitter that much, but Twitter has some really, really great communities on there. And okay. entrepreneurship um, communities are one um, VCs, like people, um, venture capitalists who are funding the startups themselves, the support systems, like the legal firms, like they're all out there. So I'll, I'll follow a lot of threads, I'll comment on threads and um, I'll DM people on Twitter as a follow up and say, hey, I'm doing this. You might be interested. Right. I'm always impressed that you're so active at those things. Like you're always out there networking. You're always trying to make those connections. What's do you have an example of like when you went to one of those events and something occurred from it? I guess just the events I put on, you just meet all sorts of different people. And naturally, I'm like, even when I'm in a room that's not one of my events, I will very happily connect other people. Okay. But there have been a couple of times where people from the community have then, and this is where the referral piece comes in, will literally go to bat for me. And Hmm. like Twitter threads will come up or other events will come up and they're there talking about what I'm doing and pitching it to other people, tagging me in. And then other people will come and like, I've had meetings with like sponsors recently, like, and they have found me purely because other people were tagging me into those threads. Interesting. So that's definitely like a big outcome from it. How many, how many events or networking, you know, components, I guess an event is really the best term. Do you go to a week? Would you say on average? Well, at the end of last year, it was insane. And, do, and there's a big thing called like New York Tech Week, which was in October. And okay. that must have had, I didn't go to them all, but there must have been about 300, 400 different events in one week. Whoa. And you could literally, you wouldn't have been able to go to them all. There just wasn't enough time. But that week I was probably at 40. Um, wow. Yeah. You, and you're just moving from like one to another to another to another. Speed dating. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Uh, but normally I'll probably go to like four or five. How do you find them? Um, so I get newsletters from there are quite a few different newsletters out there. So if people are building more like tech focused startups, then um, uh, the Charlie O'Donnell uh, newsletter is really good. That he he runs Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. Uh, Gary's Guide is another one. Um, and then also, well, a lot of people now for events, like yes, they'll post events on Eventbrite and Meetup, but a lot of people are using Luma, which is a new um, event platform. Okay. But it doesn't have a front end, so it's not like you can just like Google, hey, oh. like let me see the events. So what I do is I go to Twitter and I search for Luma. And I see what links people have posted and I find right. the events that way. I think that that what I'm hearing, you know, because I don't do all these things myself is what I'm hearing you say. I do a lot of work to find the networking events, which I think is important to highlight because unfortunately I see a lot of people um, approaching entrepreneurship as something that they think is going to be like, I'm going to make my own schedule. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this cool business. It's going to be great and so yeah. easy. And they're not willing to put in the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just wrong. (laughs) How it's like it's grueling. Tell tell me your experience with that. It it is. It's really hard. I mean, at the same time, there are definitely people out there who it tends to be those who are just naturally very very gifted at storytelling, and they can come out and, and maybe they they've come from like a JD program or maybe they're actors or whatever or just have a great gift of the gap and they will come out and they can you know, sell, like there'll be a phrase in the UK, like sell coals to Newcastle, like ice to Eskimos. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is, but they can just get you in. And so quite often what you see there is people, uh, especially like in the prior year, now the financial climate is a little bit different, but they would have an idea. They would just pitch it and they would, you know, raise like a few million uh, just for that idea. And that's like a bit, oh, because that's, you know, that's easy in some ways. You haven't had to like go and like claw your way up, whatever. Right, right. But yeah, it's a lot of it is like with any job though, it's, it's the hidden, hidden work. You, you sort of, somebody says, oh, how are you doing? You're like, oh yeah, I'm completely fine. And then you're like desperately <laughs> like trying to reply to an email or a text or, or whatever it might be. Um, 
while you're waiting for the train to come in and, and using absolutely every single second that you can. Right. Um, but I, I make a really, like my husband, for example, he's in a very different industry. He's a very, very risk averse, whereas I'm very sort of <laughs> like risk loving, risk taking. And so, yin yang. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so I make Hashtag a, marriage. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Opposites uh-huh. attract. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I make a real point of making sure that he sees what I'm doing because where I'm not going into an office, and obviously we haven't got a stable paycheck for me coming in, it's very easy, I think, for him to think, oh, I'm, I am just like faffing and like not really doing very much. But I say, I, I do this newsletter and I, I, I will bring in like quotes and events and, and um, asks that people within, within the community are doing. And I make sure that he gets that list and I get that he gets all of the invites for all the different events that I'm doing. And I'm sure he loves that, knowing him. Oh, yeah, but he doesn't really <laughs> read them, which is slightly dis- – because then you can see all the stats around the open rates and stuff, and you can see whether people are looking. John, if you're listening, <laughs> yeah. click, buddy, click. Help yourself yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yes, it can be uh, hard if people yeah. assume that entrepreneurship is easy, but right. I think, like everything, you just have to make sure that people see what you're doing. I mean, listen, I – you know, generally speaking, you know, we want we want to make generalizations. I know some people come into it really easily, but I think mm-hmm. nine out of ten entrepreneurs would say I clawed my way to the top. Right? I know I did. Um, now at the point, you know, 10, 12 years later, people are like, "Oh my God, you're you're in charge of Battery Park City. How did you do it?" I'm like, "Well, uh, first of all, I didn't make any money for the first five years. Right? Z- like zero. Thanks, Molly. Thank you for having a stable job. Kind of like what you're yeah, saying. Exactly. Right." Um, I was consistent with all these initiatives. You know, I didn't put on the networking events or whatever, but I was c- ridiculously consistent yeah, with all those marketing way. efforts. I built out a whole system um, that no one has ever done for for Battery Park City, which I, I actually won't disclose on, on the pod, you know, because I don't want to give that, that away. That is the trade secret. That is the trade secret, but I did it. And it took me three years for to mm-hmm. build out this initiative of finding people and finding their exact addresses and then, you know, really pounding them with marketing efforts. I'll give that much away. Yeah. Um, but it took me three years to build. It wasn't, it wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't a quick fix. Um, and one thing I was going to say about the newsletter is I'll encourage you and everybody else out there who's listening or watching to keep going with because just last week, this is insane. You're going to love this. I got a an email and the subject line is three bed, two bath on Rector. Okay. And the body of the email basically says, hi, I'm sure you're not going to remember me, but I came to you 10 years ago for a singing lesson with my daughter that I won at the local school because you donated these singing lessons. Uh, I've been reading your newsletter for 10 years. It's time for us to sell our $2.3 million apartment and we'd like you to interview. And I went last week, I pitched it, I got the listing. Congratulations. Thank you. But I had, first of all, I mean, not to be mean, I had no idea this person was even out there in my database, right? Because I have 11,000 people in Mm -hmm. my database. They'd been faithfully reading for 10 years. Yeah. If I hadn't kept up with that uh, newsletter every month, which, by the way, it hits the 29th of the month, and I'm like, ah, did I do it yet? No, I didn't. Brittany, quick, help me. Ah, you know, and c- consistently the last, you know, hours of whatever yeah. day it is of the month, I'm writing that newsletter, I would have lost that person. You have no idea who's out there consuming your content. And I think to your point, if I stay focused on who is my client and I know who that is and I produce co- good quality content that hits them over and over consistently, over time you're going to win because people give up. And, you know, I think what sets some of what you're doing apart from others is that you do make it so human. Yeah. So it isn't just, hey, his newsletter with, and just so you know, he hasn't paid me to say any of this. Um, <laughs> but like, I have not. I, I have not. <laughs> But She's it, getting nothing, in fact, for being on the podcast. Did you know that? Okay, <laughs> continue. Um, but it isn't a newsletter just of a load of listings and saying, yeah. do you want to buy something? No, um, yeah, yeah. It is like, hey, this is me and this is my life. And like, this is Sloan. And, yes. you know, here are, some recomm- here are some recommendations around things that you might want to do in New York or, yeah. you know, some things that we've done recently. And so it doesn't actually matter whether you are actively looking to buy or sell at that moment in time. There is value and right. it makes you feel like connected. Because I know that, you know, if and when a sad time may come where we're no longer neighbors, yeah, yeah. I would still want to read that newsletter because I would want to feel connected to you. Right. 
Yeah, which is a really good point for like marketing and and being a good marketer in entrepreneurship. It can't it can't just be all about you and your business. You have to give away a little bit and and also make that connection. So thank you. Thank you for that shout out. I mean, that is what I try to do. I try to make it a little bit personal, let people know a little bit about me. The last link is always a, an inspirate, like a song that brings me inspiration because I don't want to lose that element of music, which mm-hmm. is where like my rock. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's important. And whether you're, you know, a real estate agent or whatever business yeah. you're in, how can you, how can you humanize yourself? How can you make yourself both a person that's successful within your business and a successful human and a nice human? Yeah. You know, because yeah. there's so I, I I New Yorkers love to be scowling, but like you said, almost like um when you were saying earlier, you're at the co-working space and people are almost asking for permission yeah. to be to to come up to. Even in my daily life here in New York City, I feel like that's the case with everyone that I interact mm-hmm. with. I make sure, you know, with the barista to actually say when they say, Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? And I literally mean it and I stare at them. And they stop and look back up at me and they're like, in my, their head, I can tell they're thinking, no one's asked me that today. And and then, you know, who knows what happens? Who knows what referral comes out of that down the line? Am I doing it for the referral? No, I'm not. I'm doing it to be a nice human. Yeah. But that's how businesses grow, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. What's the, what is the single biggest thing you have learned or have been successful with in entrepreneurship? So like if you were saying to me or to one of our listeners, Man, if I if I had learned this a lot sooner, or if I could replicate this, this would be an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think leading with curiosity is is one thing that I would say, and and I sort of stumbled into this. So, uh, some people come into into entrepreneurship and they have all of their ideas completely clear cut, and and maybe they're going to work, maybe they're not. But for most people, you really do need to do a huge, huge amount of customer research. And what I was doing recently for for Meet was just interviewing lots of different co-working like owners and managers of co-working companies. Mm-hmm. And I was like asking them for favors, like left, right and center. <laughs> and I was just desperately curious around what they were doing. Um, but and they and they many of them came back to me and said, yes, I'm more than happy to talk because I led with that curiosity with that research focused mind instead of saying, hey, I just you know, can you talk to me for like 10, 15 minutes? I was very nice about it. Whereas right. interestingly, when I'd been host, trying to host some events for the co-working events that I do okay. and had done lots of um, cold outreach, the number of people who came out to me was like almost zero. Okay. So it was a very different approach. And yet by leading with curiosity and having those sort of interview research type questions, Everybody was very open. And then at the end of those conversations, when I said, oh, and I happen to run this co-working company too, they sure. then immediately turned around and said, you should host an event in my space. Ah, Which interesting. it never occurred to me that those two pieces would connect like that, but they did. And so if only I'd have like started with that approach <laughs> in the first place, I would have saved Where myself would I be now? an awful lot of time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. So I think leading that way, and again, it's like, if you're human about it, like they'll help and support. So I guess let's go to the other side of that coin. What's one thing that that you wish like has not worked out at all and you're like, I should have given up on that a long time mm-hmm. ago? Is there something? Well, I mean, all the previous business ideas. Well, um, <laughs> right. But I mean like like a thing that you do yeah. or yeah. an action. So the one thing I would say is like just originally I was very much like very close, trying to build everything myself and yes. like not no, sharing. This is headed. Not go sharing ahead. at all. Whereas what I've started to do recently is I've started working with a business coach yeah, and specifically somebody who can help me with no code. So it's basically various different platforms that allow you to build things without having to be a developer yourself. And so every hour, shout out Andrew, great name, by the way, Yes, uh, who I'm meeting uh, just after this, <laughs> every, uh, for an hour a day, I meet with him and he helps me like build so rather than me trying to learn and become an expert in various different things, he is the expert. He can help build things when I'm away, uh, but he can also teach me too. And so I've just been working with him for like a couple of weeks, but already the amount of progress that I've made has like been exponential. Right. So Cause you're able to delegate or take that off your plate. And then probably sounds like what you said earlier, you needing deadlines. I'm mm-hmm. sure you have 
lots yes, of deadlines imposed exactly, with that coach. Exactly, right? because well, also just by virtue of meeting him every day, like right. I have to keep doing things. So right. it's working on so many different levels. It's interesting. And whether it's a, I mean, daily sounds like a lot. I'm mean, good for you. But e- whether it's daily or, or weekly or yeah. monthly, having that accountability or that yeah. coach, I think is a huge thing. And I think that if you have, if you're in a business and you, you owe it to yourself mm-hmm. to have a coach, right? Uh, again, not to, not to harp too much during this, this time about being an artist, but as an artist, I coach with all different types of people. Yep. The coach for French diction, the coach for uh, dancing on stage, the coach for this. And so coaching has always been a part of my life. And I specifically, as a person, am very open to coaching. I like to be critiqued. I know that some people, they find it really difficult because they feel like they're being attacked or being told they're doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. I love it. If somebody can poke a hole in something that I'm doing and, and like you're saying, the growth is exponential. So I think, I think all entrepreneurs out there listening, uh, need, they owe it to themselves to hire a coach. And if you need a referral, email us, right. And, and, or go on Twitter or whatever. I mean, or in Instagram, I, I think it's a necessity. Yeah. But I think there's also different ways of looking at it too. So like, Yes, I'm working with Andrew uh, an hour uh, a day at the moment, like long term, like clearly that, right. won't, that won't keep yeah, going, yeah. but like we're in a new relationship. But then there's also like mentorship as well. Sure. And, you know, you can do again, cold outreach on LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm new to the space. Like, would you mind like speaking to me for 10 minutes? I know I could learn a lot from you. Like, and who knows where that relationship might go. And then sure. that person could then end up becoming, you know, quote unquote, a coach or just even somebody that you've worked with previously or whatever, right. because people love to share what they know and they desperately want to help you. It's so true. It's so true. Mm-hmm. It, you know, and I get, I get a, <laughs> I sound like I'm a social media like guru, <laughs> but I'll get, I'll get a DM from people, you know, that, that shout out to Joan, my amazing uh, girl in the Philippines who does a lot of my social media, but you know, she'll add these people and they'll DM me and say, can, you know, we talk for a few minutes about the business of real estate. And I never say no. Yeah. I might say, hey, I can't do it today, yep. but I never say no. And to your point, people just want to help yeah. other people going through this. Tori, this has been awesome for me. Thank you. Um, before we end today, I like to finish things off with a, a little bit of the fire round of the same questions for everybody. So your favorite New York City restaurant, if you could pick one, I know yeah, that's hard because you're is. a foodie like I am. You like to go out. It is really hard. Um, so I would say I've got two. <laughs> okay, um, fine. Because one of them isn't really a restaurant, so Bemelman's. Would okay. be like my favorite bar slash restaurant okay. uh, in the Carlisle in the Upper East, uh, and then Hillstone. Hillstone's so good, and I was really sad because I just learned that they've shut their one yeah, on the Lex. I know. So yeah, bye bye. What do you like at Hillstone? I mean, I just love the quality of the food. Yeah. Um, it's I go, I, I love French their tuna dip. <laughs> I love the and the little fries, the shoestring fries. Yeah. You like the tuna? I really, really love the tuna. Yeah, they have like this great tuna, like salad with um, mint and macadamia. And Mm. then they like the great sort of sesame sauce with it. Yeah. Yeah, Hillstone's great. Although sort of given that there's now any, you know, half the capacity there was before, I probably shouldn't have said that because it'll be even harder to get into now. That's fine. (laughs) Uh, If somebody comes to see you in New York City, what's your like New York City secret spot that maybe other people don't know about? Mm -hmm. Well, Do you have one? Yeah, I mean, I really am very concerned about sharing this one. Oh, <laughs> that means it's really good. Well, it depends what your thing is, but like company culture coffee is at Grand Central. Okay. And it is oh, it, I it's actually the know building what you're about. Yeah. next to it. <laughs> and it's a giant, giant like communal space yes. hidden in plain sight. Yes. And it's great for co-working and or meetings. Uh, so. I'm actually surprised I haven't seen you there because I use that space a lot when I don't want to come to the office because it's amazingly located. Like you're saying, there's not a soul there. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You can meet anybody there. It's so convenient. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And also, don't go. Yes. We want our tables still. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) If you were sitting here and I had a camera on you like three or five years ago, what Mm -hmm. would you tell yourself? Just get out of your own way. Like you've got this. Like just believe in yourself more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's actually, I really wish like failing and doing things that scare you was almost like a course that you had to take mm. because it's just so easy to think you can't do something. You can't do something. Whereas the more that you normalize failing, like literally as you were a kid, like not that I want people to fall out of a tree, but like the more you do little things like that, the more yeah. you realize that you just bounce back, you know? Interesting. So that would Elasticity. Be, yeah. 
Huh. Yeah, building right. it as a muscle. I like that. What's I, I love investing in all those things. You know that about mm-hmm. me because we're friends outside of this room. But what's the be- best money management thing that you do? Because I think that another component of entrepreneurship that we haven't touched on much is is you know being mindful of your money. So yeah. what's what's one thing you do that's been good? Yeah. So I mean, I I do invest. Uh, like you know, think about pensions, things like that. I, yeah. I think the classic. Split supposed to be, I don't know. I don't even know what it is, but you're supposed to have a mixture of equities and bonds because bonds are like normally safe uh, and equity like goes up and down. Mine is only equity. So I have none of that. Well, safe you're risky. You already stuff. said. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then also I belong to lots of different communities and I'm very good at finding promo codes. So that's a real mix. So you've got something which is like a long-term strategy and something that is a very short-term strategy. Short-term, she will keep her money in her pocket. Yeah. I like that, actually. And I'm upset you haven't shared those with me already. (laughs) Uh, And your favorite book? Uh, Brave Not Perfect by Reshma Sojani. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's it's just a really easy read, but it is, again, it just, and I think given the the three line for this yeah. like conversation about, you know, fear and just learning and not being afraid to to do things. Uh, I think it's it's a fantastic book. She speaks about her own life of um I, I guess the differences between like seeing like boys grow up and the way they're taught and girls grow up and the way they're taught and girls having to be sort of prim, proper and, you know, beautiful oh, guys. I have to read this, guys it. being allowed to like, you know, do the messy things. Um yeah. And then she quit her job. She ran for uh, an elected position. She didn't get it. But then she went on to found Girls Who Code, which is like a huge, huge, huge organization. I don't know quite how many people. Right. Um, and is now like a, a very respected um, go-to resource. Okay. As a girl dad, I will be getting this immediately upon walking out of the room. <laughs> Tori, thank you so much for joining me thank today. You, Everybody listening, hashtag climate change. We love you. See you next time.